Good morning, everyone. I think uh, most of the people coming to this session, you're here already. You're excited about it. I can, I can tell. I can feel it. Um, you're in CO2 extraction, um, as a, you can see the, the, to the PowerPoint uh, on my right. Um, welcome to the conference, one, uh, one team, one goal. Uh, hopefully you guys were in the, uh, the keynote and you heard uh, some of the speakers there. Uh, it's good stuff. Um, otherwise, just a reminder for uh, continuing education credits, the code is right here to check in. Um, there'll be a new code at the end of the session. Make sure you check out and make sure you do your conference and session evals uh, by March 31st in order to get the uh, credit that you deserve. So um, that's uh, the plug for that. Otherwise, um, I wanted to just mention briefly about our speaker today, Andy Joseph. Um, he will give his own self-intro, but I don't know how many of you took the session last year at the last conference. So excellent. So, so the, I uh, was a cannabis track coordinator last year, and I participated in a lot of the cannabis uh, courses and sessions. And by far, I thought Andy's session was the best, not only in the cannabis session, but the whole conference. So I think it's really pr um, a privilege to have him back here today. Um, and I, you guys are in for a treat, so soak it all in. And please join me in welcome, Andy Joseph. Sorry for the noise there. That's really close to my face. All right, can everybody hear me okay in the back? You guys? You guys okay? Everybody good? Can everybody see the uh, PowerPoint thing? All right. Um, great. So, so uh, thanks, Nick, for the introduction. I'll be uh, left already. Um, this, uh, this is titled CO2 Extraction, uh, the methods and devices to uh, create uh, cannabis concentrates. It does go broader and, and, uh, and, and more, um, uh, more in-depth into beyond just CO2 extraction. So it talks about hydro hydrocarbon extractions, ethanol extractions, a lot of the equipment, some of the basic fundamentals. What this isn't is a deep dive into codes, regulations, standards, those kind of things. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, not a code compliance kind of uh, inspector kind of guy, um, so that's not where I'm going to go. Um, but I, what I would like to try to demonstrate for everybody here is you know, a couple different things. One, why are we here today? Why are we talking about cannabis? Who cares about cannabis stuff? I got some, uh, some, some slides that I think you'll find interesting from an economic and business standpoint that give a little bit of insight as to why the cannabis industry is growing as, as crazy as it is right now. Uh, also, a little bit of background uh, on myself, my company, and then um, want to talk about some of the specific processing steps, techniques, and the equipment that you guys might be uh, might be likely to see in different processing operations uh, throughout the country. Uh, I did have a request at the beginning uh, for samples, and I just got to go ahead and you know, clarify: there are no samples that, at the end of it. That joke still goes. I've been doing this for seven years now, and that that, that joke still just uh, keeps going. All right, so my name's uh, Andy Joseph. Uh, my background, I started uh, six years, spent uh, six, six years in Pearl Harbor in the nuclear uh, submarine business. Um, after I got out of the military, I went to Ohio State University. Anybody here from Ohio or Ohio State? Go Bucks. OH? Hey, there we go, yeah. Uh, so I went to Ohio State University, got my bachelor's and uh, master's degrees in welding engineering. Um, and while I was doing that, I started as an intern at my, what quote unquote, what I called real job at the time. Uh, which was a director of an engineering group at well Edison Welding Institute. We focused primarily on welding and, and engineering research, specifically focused on joining applications. So if you wanted to weld two things together or join two things together, that's what we really focused on. But while I was doing that, I started a part-time job. Really, I got out of college, after I got out of the military and started college, I, uh, I wasn't making enough money to pay the bills. And you know the GI Bill covered some of it, but didn't pay enough. So I started a fabrication business on the side. My dad was a machinist uh, and a bottle welder and, and you know decided to start welding some stuff. So one of the customers that I met was in the botanical oil extraction equipment business. He had just a small glassware product line. And I said, well, you know, well, that's pretty cool. And he's like, well, I'd, make make, I'd like to make some stuff out of metal. So I said, well, sure, I'll give it a try. I knew nothing about what it was or what it was for. Uh, and, you know, that, that was my, my entry into the cannabis extraction equipment world. Uh, it wasn't from, you know, uh, a marijuana focus. It wasn't from a botanical oils focus. It was from a manufacturing standpoint. So I did that all the way up until uh, 2012 as a part-time job that... Uh, We'll show you here just in a second. I went too far, sorry. I did that originally as a part-time job in my, uh, in my backyard, literally a pole barn in my backyard, kind of an entrepreneur at, at heart. I started Apex Fabrication at the time. 
And uh, from 2001 until 2009, we built some of these metal and, and uh, botanical oil extraction systems. What we found is that most of the applications at the time were essential oils, flavorings, food products, things like that. Somewhere around 2008, 2009, the cannabis industry found us. They said, hey, CO2 extraction is pretty cool. We would really like to, to be able to do that. Uh, and it was primarily here in California. What we found is that doctors in particular who were interested in providing medical cannabis to their patients didn't really have a good solution when it came to non-smoking or extracted or concentrated solutions. So, you know, the medical marijuana industry was, was interested, in particular, the doctors in California had two problems. One was the extraction businesses were very unsafe at the time. So they were primarily using hydrocarbon, cans of butane, using open blasting, which we'll talk about later on in the, in the presentation. But they were also not tested. Uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, irregularities, a lot of inaccuracies, a lot of just untested material was, was being uh, given and made available to patients. And the doctors, you know, didn't like it because they were trying to, you know, really cure people. It wasn't recreational at the time. Um, there was lots of interest from recreational, but they were more just interested in getting high. The true medical side is, is what kind of interests me in it. So then uh, 2012 got to the point where I had two full-time jobs. My engineering career that I'd, I'd started and worked at for 12 years, uh, came to a point where I, you know, I, I was working 40, 50 hours there, and then I would go home and, and work 40 or 50 hours in my pole barn in my backyard. So I made the leap. The cannabis industry in 2012, uh, Colorado and Washington had both uh, legalized recreational. So I decided to take the leap and, and jump in. 2013, 99% um, of our customers were in the cannabis industry at that point. So it transitioned over those 10 years from you know, being almost exclusively botanical oils and essential oils to the cannabis industry. Um, 2015, we moved into a, a brand new 17,000 square foot manufacturing facility, which I'll show you here in the next slide. And um, about a year and a half ago, we shipped our 500th CO2 extraction system. Uh, just for reference, these things cost anywhere from 85,000 to about 1.2 million, uh, with our average price being $250,000 roughly. Um, and uh, about a year and a half ago, in the fall of 2017, we shipped our 500th system. So we've experienced a you know a tremendous amount of success uh, in our in our business. A lot of competition. It's not easy by any stretch of the imagination. But I think you'll, you'll I hope by the end of this presentation, you'll appreciate some of the, the work and the dedication that goes into the stuff and have a, a better understanding and, and um, be able to, to, to help the other entrepreneurs who are out in the cannabis industry who are my customers. As I mentioned, we uh, moved in in uh, 2015 to a 17,000 square foot manufacturing facility. This is a purpose-built facility. This, 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 uh, this manufacturing uh, vehicle was designed specifically to build CO2 extraction systems. That's all we do in there. Um, we don't do any other, any products, any other services, things like that. Um, and now here we are three years later, almost four years later, and we're already expanding. So we're adding on another 15,000 square foot to the back of it uh, to handle the demand for CO2 extraction. A little bit more about the background of the company. We have 35 employees, six military veterans. Um, I'm, I'm preferential being a veteran myself to hiring military veterans. We have seven degreed engineers, um, two with advanced degrees, um, you know, being uh, PhDs or master's degrees. Backgrounds, ASME, um, ASME is American Society of Mechanical Engineers. That's the pressure vessel and or pressure containing systems, uh, codes and standards. Honda, our controls engineer, spent 25 years at Honda, uh, specifically managing the, the paint line, where if the paint line goes down for any period of time, it's a million dollars a minute uh, for any downtime that, that that system runs. And so that's kind of the approach that we take when we design our systems, no downtime. American Welding Society, again, that's uh, the background of myself. And then, you know, we've had some, you know, a significant number of awards, but some of the more popular ones that I like to, to cover. Some business ones, we ranked 524th fastest growing private company in 2016. That's in the entire United States uh, with 8,000 some odd percent growth. Uh, 2016, we won the Edison Awards. We got beat by 3M. Okay, I don't, you know, it's not too bad to uh, take second place to 3M. And by in 2018, we were uh, one of the 50 best companies to work for in the cannabis space. So even though we don't actually touch the plant material, we don't touch, uh, we don't actually do extractions ourselves. We actually get lumped into the cannabis industry because that's where all of our customers are. Uh, that does present problems with banking and that kind of stuff, which I'm not going to get into. But if you have questions, I'm happy to discuss it. Again, we've got uh, we shipped our 500th CO2 extractor at the end of 2017. By uh, just recently here, uh, I think maybe this week, we shipped our 575th system. So we continue to see a, a real increase, a real um, 
real desire for extraction, specifically CO2 extraction in our business. One thing to note, you'll see a lot of, uh, a lot of our customers there, these are not big industrial plants yet. Uh, these, aren't, these, are, these tend to be more skid-based platforms. They're not big industrial facility uh, built around of machine kind of setups. These are much more smaller um, and not so much portable, but transportable type of systems. So why are we all here? It, it, real quick, uh, let, me get a, let me get a quick kind of a read on the audience here. Who in your municipality allows cannabis extracts or processing or, or things like that? Looks like maybe half, a little bit of half the room. How many have municipalities that have bans, moratoriums, don't allow it for one reason or another? How many don't know? That should be the rest. <laughs> I got half the room and I got three people. I need to get the rest of them. All right, so uh, anyway, so most people will, uh, will allow. I know there's a couple people in here who don't uh, have municipalities who, who don't allow cannabis processing. But you know, one of the biggest questions that I always get is who cares? Why, what's this, this cannabis thing? People just trying to get high. Well, let's give some insight into the, the marketplace. Uh, you know, currently the cannabis industry, if you look at this chart, this comes from uh, BDS Analytics, you'll see in, in 2014, 2014 to 2018, cannabis industry grew from about $3 billion to $12 billion, right? Relatively small when it comes to, you know, the overall economy, you know, the oil and gas is hundreds of billions of dollars and things like that. But it's, you know, been a pretty significant growth since 2014. With the, with the entire industry, legal industry, both medical and recreational, representing about $12 billion. There's four or five different projections you're going to see out there, but they all center somewhere around that $30 million number in about four years. So there's essentially an exponential curve. There's a 26% uh, compound annual growth rate that is projected or expected in the cannabis industry. One of the fastest growing industries in the United States right now, faster than the dot-com was 10, 20 years ago. That's why there's so many people interested in it today. That's why there's so many questions. That's why there's such a buzz, quote unquote, uh, no pun intended, on the cannabis industry. Some things to note, where is it coming from, right? This is an interesting chart in that it shows that, you know, the purple is all U.S. growth, U.S.-based, again, me medical and recreational growth. Canada came online recently. Canada has fully legalized both medical and recreational on a federal level. And you'll notice that Canada still only makes up, just, just in 2018, still only makes it up just a tiny bit of overall sales. The U.S. is where the market lies. The blue that you see here is, the, is ROW. Anybody know what ROW stands for? I didn't. It took me forever to figure it out. Rest of the world. Right? So it's the rest of the world. I had to go ask these guys, what the heck is ROW? Is it like Republic of China? Um, so the rest of the world makes up a very, very significant portion, right? Considering that the U.S. is, you know, 300 million people and the entire, country, the entire world is 8 billion people, right? The U.S. is where the weed industry really is, uh, is, is focused on growing right now. But some interesting things start to come out when you look at the details, right? It's not just flour anymore. So you go 2,000, this is, uh, this is strictly in Colorado. So, uh, you know, don't, don't uh, translate the, the dollars here. If you look at just the Colorado, you can see a trend, right? The green stuff on the bottom is conveniently flour. And so flour growth from 2014 to 2018 has really kind of been flatlined. It's, it's peaked up a little bit, but not much. Um, the, the large majority, almost the entire majority, falls into the concentrates, which is the purple, and the edibles, which is the blue. So concentrates and edibles, these, these extracted products, is really where the growth lies within the fast-growing cannabis industry. Again, this is why you're seeing so much activity, so much interest in cannabis extracted or cannabis concentrate products because of the fact that it's, it's where all the growth is. The growth isn't in cultivation. The growth isn't in flowers. Right? The growth is in these new cannabis products, these concentrated types of products. So that was Colorado. What about other places? Well, I don't have the exact same type of chart to show you for every state, but generally you can see if you look at any kind of representative quarter, this happens to be third quarter of 2018, you can see Con concentrates, edible products, and uh, concentrates are represent a significant portion, 50% here in California for, for uh, third quarter of 18. 47% for Colorado, 48% for Oregon, 45%, sorry, I said that backwards, Arizona, 45% for Oregon. Right? There's a significant growth trajectory and there's a significant interest in these concentrates types of products. We're going to go through and talk about what these concentrate products are, what these, these infused products and these edibles and all these different types of product categories are. But I think it's important for you guys to understand why there's so much interest in, in this. 
Another way to look at Colorado, if you look at the concentrate growth, this is from quarter one 2014 to quarter one 2018. The growth in the concentrate area was represented 40% of the overall growth of every type of cannabis product available. So concentrates is, is definitely where all the growth sits. Again, flower did see a little bit of growth, but nowhere near as much as concentrates and edibles. Now, while it's growing, it's also important to note that it's commoditizing at the same time, right? And basically what happens in a commoditizing industry is supply starts to meet demand. When demand's high, prices are high, supply starts to come up and ramp up and ramp up, and eventually supply will meet demand. And unfortunately, a lot of times supply will overshoot demand. And that's absolutely what happened in Oregon. Oregon's got the worst case scenario of, of, of supply, uh, supply exceeding demand significantly to the point where it's, it's crushed the, the flower price all the way from $9.27 back in January of 16 to $4.27 in November of 18. Right? So we've, we've seen significant price depression or commoditization in the Oregon flower market. But at the same time, concentrate prices, now this is, this is not completely fair to, to compare you know, Oregon to Colorado, but stick with me on it anyway. At the same time, for the data that's available in Colorado, you're seeing the prices of edibles not decreasing as much. So while the entire industry is commoditizing, the flowers, the buds, are, are what's really getting price depression and commoditization efforts. But you don't see it quite as much in the edibles, in the concentrate categories. You don't see those prices falling quite as much. And it's generally because those types of products can differentiate themselves, right? They can stand out. A flower is a flower, and yeah, it looks good, and it has some terpenes and whatever it might have, but it's still just a flower. You gotta smoke it, maybe you can vape it. Concentrate products have a wide variety of, of products available. And so you can have your, your edibles, you can have your vape pens, you can have your topicals, your lotions, all these different product types, and lots of differentiation opportunities within them. So you're seeing higher prices, essentially, for what is the same gram of THC or CBD in these types of concentrated products. Here in California, it's actually done the opposite. Prices of cannabis extracted products or concentrates has actually gone up from $14 back in 17 up to $20, right? This is an average price per gram. This is, this is incredible, right? So generally, when you see a commoditizing industry, you see prices going down. Here, not only is the, is the industry growing incredibly rapidly, we're actually able to get a higher price for it at the same time. Again, more insight into why people are interested in the cannabis world, why people are, are kind of scrambling to get part of the, what's uh, termed a lot of times the green rush. Any questions? I, I, don't, I don't want to see it. This is kind of like an hour and 45 minutes or something like that, so I don't want to stand up here and drone for the whole time. Any, uh, any questions anybody's got uh, before we move on to kind of the next stuff? Uh, so the question was, am I getting any pushback on, the, uh, on our business from the federal government? When you say, am I, are you talking about my business specifically, the extraction business, the extraction companies, or? Uh... Yeah, no, that's, that's a fantastic question. So there's, uh, there's two worlds out there. There's the plant touching world, uh, which is, includes our customers, who are the people that take the, the plant material and extract the oil from it to generate these concentrate types of products. And then there's ancillary businesses, myself included, where we manufacture a piece of equipment that services the cannabis industry. You can look at other ancillary businesses like uh, banks, or I'm sorry, like uh, lawyers, accountants, um, you know, any kind of the people that print packaging materials, anybody that uh, basically provides a service. Think Levi Strauss for the, the gold rush, right? They made jeans and you know, picks and axes, those kinds of things. Those are all what's termed ancillary product companies. Uh, and, and generally, uh, we get left alone, certainly by the federal government. You know, they're not really interested in ancillary product suppliers as much as they are in the plant touching businesses, IRS in particular. Um, the DEA doesn't typically get involved in the, in the legal entities, at least that we see anyway. Uh, so our customers, you know, we've got almost 600 customers out there. Very, very few of them have any problems with the DEA, as long as they pay their taxes and as long as they're licensed. Uh, when they're not, they get busted. And we've had customers that, uh, you know, unfortunately chose that route. Um, but, you know, where, where we do tend to get impacted more is on the banking side. So banks tend to lump us in. Uh, you know, we get, we get referred to as what's called a marijuana-related business or an MRB. And so a lot of times, even though we don't take money directly from, um, you know, customers, our customers are plant-touching businesses, and so the revenue that we get is from marijuana. So a lot of times banks will be afraid of us, our insurance, our insurance rates are higher, things like, things like that. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a bit of a challenge. 
but not nearly as big of a challenge as some of our customers who you know don't have access to banking. Uh, Nevada, in particular, is is terrible uh, about their their cash and their cash handling. Uh, California is actually where we had a bank for a long time, and um, they they kind of they kind of look the other way. They tend to not ask questions, but it's uh, a real key thing that uh, that we've understood and we've learned over the last 10 or 15 years, is it's a choice. Uh, you know, when you talk about banks and you talk about insurance companies and you talk about accounting firms, it's total choice. There's no federal agency that's telling a bank you can't bank the cannabis industry. They just say, hey, it's illegal, and therefore you're taking a risk. Generally, there's somebody uh, in, an, in, a, in a legal capacity at a bank that has a choice to make. And it's a, it's a choice on whether or not uh, they want that bank to take the risk associated with banking the cannabis industry. Because the federal government could come and, and uh, you know, take away their, their banking licenses or whatever it might be. But it's a choice. It's an absolute choice. And I'll, I'll, I'll answer, you know, I'll, I'll give one more uh, quick, quick example just to, to kind of demonstrate why it's a choice. When we built our 15,000 square foot uh, manufacturing facility, I had a hard time getting a loan. Uh, we don't touch the plant. We don't, you know, our customers are in the cannabis industry, but, you know, we're in Ohio. We didn't even have, there's, it wasn't even legal in Ohio at the time. Uh, so a PNC Bank, believe it or not, actually gave us a loan on the building. And, they, you know, the sales guy comes in and he's like, oh, yeah, we're, we're super interested in your business. We want all your depository and your credit card account and all this different stuff. And we say, great, this is fantastic. How about cash? You guys take cash? Whoa, 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 whoa hold on now. We don't, we don't want any cash. It's a bank. They don't want cash. So... After that, you know, we go through this process, we get this thing out. I went to the press, right? And I said, hey, we're, you know, the, the, the press says, hey, you guys are building a new building, got new industry coming to your small community. That's fantastic. Who gave you the loan? I said, PNC. Three days later, you know, two guys in suits show up at my house, you know, pole barn in my backyard, show up at my house, and they're the compliance directors for PNC. And it said, you know, three, three pages of questions about where the money comes from and who are our customers and are they licensed and all these different things. Basically, what came down to is the, the sales guy didn't vet it well enough. He didn't vet it up to the chain. It's a big organization. It was a relatively small loan, and they didn't pay enough attention. But what they, what they did at the end of it was what's important. They chose to close down all of our accounts, all our depository, all our credit card, all, that, all our, my kids' savings accounts, for that matter. But what they didn't close was the loan. They chose to keep the loan because it would create what they considered to be a hardship condition. Right? And the hardship condition and the, and the subsequent fallout and the advertising of me complaining about having the jobs and the loan taken away and my poor business, veteran, oh, you know, imagine the, imagine the headlines. So they chose to keep it. Right? It was a lower risk to, to keep the loan than it was to let it go. That's some insight into you know, the world of banking and the choices that, that people have to make and, and some of the challenges that you know, certainly our customers in the cannabis industry have to make. Long answer to your question. I promise they won't all be that long. So. Okay, so uh, I'm going to shift over to the, the cannabis product types. Okay, so got to throw out a disclaimer here. This is not an all-inclusive list. Oops, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so the, the question is, is the equipment, uh, can it be transferred, translated, uh, can it be utilized in other botanical oil extractions? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, they just don't pay as much, right? So, you know... The, some of the some of the really really uh, expensive anybody familiar with doTERRA for instance essential oil company um, you know a lot of the doTERRA extracts are made with things like hexane pentane ethanol uh, was one other one because they're fast and they're relatively inexpensive CO2 creates a better a cleaner extract because it doesn't have the the nasty residuals uh, residuals that are going to come from things like pentane hexane ethanol uh, butane propane um, but they generally don't have a high enough price point to garner what is the lower output rate the lower throughput of CO2. See? Shorter answer. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Uh, so farm bill passed in, uh, in, in earlier, I guess it was last year, um, which, you know, basically legalized hemp. The challenge in that is it didn't necessarily legalize CBD, right? And so the CBD is, is, is one of the compounds that are found within hemp. Same way that THC and sometimes CBD are found in marijuana. So the hemp bill legalized, I'm sorry, the, the farm bill legalized hemp, but it left the CBD and the extract world kind of gray still. Um, the FDA stepped in and said, hey, you can't do this, the same way they come in and step in, you know, in the, more to the natural supplements market and say, quit making claims that, you know, your, your uh, acai juice, juice is going to cure cancer, right? You can't do that kind of stuff. They put out a similar warning to the, the CBD world. The problem is some of the, some of the local municipalities, some of the sheriffs and, the, and, and uh, police chiefs and things like that, interpreted that as it's still illegal. 
And so there's, CBD is an even worse gray market, gray area than cannabis and THC has ever been because there's no regulation, there's no attempt at regulation, and it's completely gray. There's really no specifications on what's going on. The equipment works, works the same. All the equipment that I'm going to talk about, all the different extraction processes that I'm going to talk about will absolutely work on hemp the same way they work on cannabis and THC. Uh, but the hemp market is, is very, very wild west, right? A lot of people talk about THC and marijuana being the wild west. It really isn't anymore. It's so highly regulated and it's so closely watched that it, it, it just, it, it's not like that anymore. It's not the wild west. There's still black market, don't get me wrong, there's still people out there doing bad stuff. But generally the legal industry just doesn't have that problem. CBD now, however, does because it's legal. You can buy it on Amazon, you can ship it across all 50 states, you can, you can produce it in any capacity you want, nobody's gonna ask any questions. But I would argue it's very unsafe, right? There's no testing requirements, there's no legal regulations, and other than the FDA saying don't, there's nobody really stopping them. And so it, it's, a, it's kind of a crazy area right now. So again, I'm gonna go through some, some kind of broad categories that you're gonna find, primarily in the cannabis industry, but again, the CBD industry is, is, uh, is coming up quickly as well. So the first one we're going to talk about is vape pens or vape pen oils. And, uh, you know, these are, are sometimes referred to as vape pen cartridges. Uh, sometimes they're disposable. So there'll be, a, you know, you get 50 hits on one of them. Sometimes the vape pen cards are there. Generally sold in half gram or maybe even one gram capacities. And that's uh, basically the, the oil that's inside the cart. So if you look at this thing, this is a battery down here on the bottom. And this is a, a, a cartridge referred to on the top. Uh, you, you draw in or you suck on the, on the mouthpiece up here, it draws in air, creates some heat through a, a heating element, the oil vaporizes and you, you suck it in. Um, there are a slew, there's probably 500, maybe even 1,000 different types of vape pen and or vape pen cartridges available on the market today. 99.999% of them are made in China. Uh, one of the big challenges that you're seeing right now is actually in heavy metals. Uh, seeing a lot of lead testing, now, now in particular in California, uh, requiring lead testing, what they're finding is a lot of heavy metals that are they're propping up inside of these vape pen cartridges. Now the question is, is the cartridge producing the lead? Because it's coming from China. Not that China puts out lead in everything, but they put lead in some stuff. But, or is it coming from the oil? Right? Cannabis, hemp are both accumulator plants. In other words, when they're grown, especially outdoors, they tend to draw up heavy metals, pesticides, any kind of crap that's in the, in the soil, they tend to draw it up and put it in there. When you extract, you concentrate. So if you have, you know, let's say 0.001% you know, heavy metal inside of, a, inside of a plant, when you concentrate it, now it's going to be 0.01. And if you further distill it, it might be 0.1. You essentially are concentrating that pesticide, you're concentrating that heavy metal. And that's a real problem that, that's going on right now in the industry that, uh, that people are faced with. It hasn't really defer, deterred anybody. Vape pens are by far the most popular category of the, of the concentrate uh, and or extract marketplace within the cannabis industry. Very easy to use, very simple. Uh, soccer moms love them, it's discreet, doesn't create the big vape clouds. Don't confuse these with what you might see as the nicotine vape pens, right, which make those huge, huge clouds and the guys are blowing smoke circles and that kind of stuff. They don't put any of that stuff in here to do these. These are much more discreet, they, they don't smell. Um, they, you know, the, it's, a, it's a very, very popular product. Commonly used solvents. When, we just, when I describe solvents up here, I'm talking about primarily the, the initial extraction process. Uh, a lot of times you'll see vape pens that are made with CO2. A lot of times you'll see them made with butane and propane. Another common type of, of oil uh, is what's referred to as distillate. Uh, in, in particular, to your question with the, the hemp and the CDB, CBD market, um, distillate is becoming very, very popular. Um, sometimes it's referred to as the clear. That was kind of a trade name that was put together by a company here in California about four or five years ago. Uh, just because it's, it's generally more clear. It's, more, it's, not, uh, it's not quite as uh, brown as what you saw on the previous slide there. Commonly used solvents. Used to be CO2 and uh, butane and propane up until about six, maybe eight months ago. Ethanol has really had a huge surge in this area where ethanol extractions are becoming the primary uh, mechanism. I think it's actually one thing. Um, yeah, ethanol extractions are becoming one of the primary uh, solvents being utilized specifically for CBD distillate. Um, because of its fast, it, it, it's fast, it's effective. We'll talk more about that here in a little bit. Secondary process, this is important. You can't create distillate without first doing an extraction. And sometimes there's even a few processes in between those two. So a lot of times if you guys go into a uh, processing facility, a cannabis extraction facility, you're going to see multiple pieces of equipment, multiple steps. There's not one piece of equipment that's going to do all of these things that we're describing. Extraction has to happen first. Extraction can be with ethanol, can be with CO2, can be with butane, can be with propane. 
once you've done that extraction, then you go through secondary processing, which generally consists of some kind of filtration. Uh, sometimes it's going to be pesticide remediation. Uh, and then you're going to get into the, the distillate process. Why does anybody do this? Who cares? Well, if you think about the, the extraction process, the concentration process, basically what we're doing is we're taking THC and marijuana or CBD and hemp, and we're trying to get it as pure as possible. So people who are looking for distillate are trying to get essentially 95, 99% pure distillate. Right, pure THC, pure CBD. Why would anybody want that? Well, think about it. If you're going to make a cookie, if you're going to make a chocolate, uh, you don't necessarily want it to smell like weed. You want it to smell like chocolate, or you want it to smell like a cookie, or you want it to smell like spaghetti sauce. And so, if, if, in order to, to utilize the, the THC or the, you know, what is effectively the, 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 the primary ingredient from a cannabis plant, you've got to get it to a point where it's pure enough to be able to use it as like an ingredient. Think, you know, flour, eggs, milk, those kind of things when they go into a cookie. This just becomes another ingredient. When you do an initial extraction, you go from, let's, let's just throw out some rough numbers, 10% cannabinoid content in, in what's trim, or maybe 20% cannabinoid content in flour. The initial extraction process, again, whether it's ethanol, butane, CO2, it's going to take it up to 50, maybe 60% pure THC, cannabinoids, whatever it might be. When you go to a further refinement step like distillation, that takes you from that 50, 60% up into the 90s, 80s, 90s, sometimes even 99%. This is essentially a purification process or a refinement process after the extraction is done. It's a very, very common process, very, very popular, especially in the CBD industry right now with, with, uh, with ethanol extractions. The types of equipment you can plan to see, short path distillation is going to be this side here. This is a lot of glassware. Uh, we're still seeing this. The, these, these processes, the throughput, the volumes that we're doing are really not big enough to, to, to interest um, these large processing facilities that you're going to find in the food manufacturing industry primarily. So these tend to still be you know, smaller bench top or, or skid based types of equipment. The short path distillation piece of equipment right here can do 15, I'm sorry, can do 5 to 15 liters per day of extracted oil. This, now that's pure THC. This system over here is a larger piece of uh, what's called white filmed or short or uh, uh, thin film or white filmed distillation apparatus. It can get up into 100 liters per day. And so it's still you know, relatively small volumes. You're not going to see 55 gallon drums of these things sitting around on shelves and warehouses. Right? It's just not the, it's not the kind of volumes that we're talking about yet. It's getting there, but it's not there yet. Terpenes is the other primary, what I'm going to call oil. I, don't know, I really didn't have anywhere to put this one, so I just kind of lumped it in with the oil because it's liquid like oil. Seem reasonable. Terpenes are the, the flavors, the aroma, the, the volatile oils that come off of anything, right? So you see the list here. I don't know if you guys can read that. Limonene, uh, I can't read it myself either. So all the different smells, citrus, uh, citrus aromas, all the, the, the woody, the earthy, the citrusy, the skunky, all of the smells that come from food and food types of products, not just cannabis are generally created or, or, or come through what's called terpenes, or the, you know, which are primarily in the volatile oils. The terpenes have become, in the, certainly in the last year, maybe two years, become extremely popular. So if you, if you look at kind of the, the trends in cannabis and, and the, the concentrate industry in particular, two, three, four years ago was this mad rush to see how pure you can make it. How pure can I get my THC, right? 99, 99.9, .9. how pure can I get my THC? And then everybody went, well, this kind of sucks. It gets you high, but where's all the fun, right? Where's, it doesn't smell like weed. It doesn't taste like weed. So the you know, recreational industry kind of actually went backwards and stopped trying to make things as highly concentrated as they could and get back to the flavors and the aromas. And terpenes is how they do it. So a lot of times you'll see different extraction methods being employed to get to an end product. Some term, sometimes you'll see the, the term called full spectrum extract. And basically what that is is a, a, an extract that only has 50, maybe 60% cannabinoids in it but it also has a significant amount of terpenes in it. And this is mostly vape pens. You don't see this quite in the, in the edible area. Mostly in vape pens, you're going to see a lot of, a lot of the terpenes. Sometimes the terpenes are going to be uh, extracted directly from the plant material. CO2 is, a, is an excellent way to go about doing that. Another way is steam distillation, where you'll see what a lot of times are referred to as artificial terpenes. There's two types of artificial terpenes. There are plant-derived artificial terpenes, in other words, not cannabis. Or there's actually, you know, artificial or chemically based or chemically derived terpenes. Either way, you know, guys that uh, sit there and they'll put together, use their noses and try to, you know, emulate or simulate what a cannabis plant smells like, both when you're smoking it or when you're vaporizing it. And those are what, you know, a lot of people refer to as artificial terpenes. Other, other folks will try to differentiate themselves and have cannabis-based terpenes, 
which were extracted directly from the plant material. Sometimes they'll take the terpenes, set them off to the side, go all the way through the rest of the extraction refinement process, create a pure distillate, 99, 95% pure, then they'll take the terpenes back over here, put them into the distillate. That creates a full spectrum distillate. A lot of combinations in, the, in between there going on, but just to give some insight into you know, what these different customers are doing, what these different product types are, that's what you're gonna see. Tinctures is, uh, is kind of the next area. So tinctures is, is generally, you can find tinctures, you go to any health food store, you're gonna find tinctures anywhere. Um, you'll, you'll see, generally they're gonna be ethanol or alcohol based. Um, and they can be tinctures of walnut oil, they can be tinctures of, of rose hips or whatever it might be. And the cannabis industry, they are, not surprisingly, THC and CBD. And various, uh, various ratios of them, right? So these are all different tinctures down here on the bottom. And, you know, one of them's THC uh, on, the, on the left, the other one's CBD on the right. And the ones in the middle are varying increments or varying ratios of those THC and CBD. Again, mostly common solids you're going to find are CO2 and ethanol. Uh, a lot of times the, the tinctures are going to have, um, they're, they, they aren't necessarily going to taste so much like the marijuana plants. So they don't have a lot of terpenes in them. Uh, but the, the mechanism that you utilize this, as opposed to drawing it into your lungs through a vape pen or through a distillate cartridge, you put it underneath your tongue, right? You go through the mucosal layer in your, in your, uh, in your mouth. That gets into your bloodstream a lot faster, uh, similar to the same way your lungs, certainly a lot faster than going through your gut in, uh, in an edible process. So tinctures are, are very popular, especially in the CBD industry, um, not as much in the, in the cannabis industry. Uh, infused products. Okay, so anything that goes in you or on you, right? So we talked about inhaling, going into your lungs, tinctures going underneath your mouth. You got a question? Yeah, exactly. So these are all droppers. Uh, they're basically you know, like medicine droppers you give to like your kids and stuff. Um, these, uh, and so they're, they're all, they're very liquidy, they're very viscous, not very viscous, sorry. Um, and so they, you know, just drop in there, a couple few drops. Um, much like we were talking about before with, with, with no regulation on, on dosing, essentially. Uh, you know, unless you get into some of the newer states, like Ohio, for instance, has dosing requirements for THC. But CBD, you know, you can have, you know, this one's got, I think, a thousand milligrams of CBD in it, and you could drink the whole thing if you wanted to. Uh, it wouldn't do anything to you that we know of, but I don't know. I wouldn't want to drink the whole thing. Um, THC on the other side, you know, you drink 1,000 milligrams of THC, you're going to have a hard time for the next 12 hours. Um, there, are, there are some people that, uh, that, that will make anecdotal claims that CBD offsets um, some of the challenges of, of uh, what would be effectively an overdose on THC. So to kind of get you back down on the, onto the ground there. Um, but it's all really anecdotal. It's one of the fundamental problems with the cannabis industry. And back to your original question about the federal government, there's not a lot of testing going on. There is some, but there's not a lot, not enough to really help these things out. So the industry is growing faster than the science and the research. And, you know, people are basically left on their own accord to experiment with it. I, I hope that answers your question. Literally anywhere. You can go to Amazon right now and have it shipped to your house. Not, not THC. At least not legally, anyway. Sure. Yeah, so right now it's best classified as a dietary supplement and 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 in fall. Exactly. And that that's this that's the gray area. It's not currently classified as a dietary supplement. It's currently classified as federally illegal, right? And yet hemp's legal and and all you have all this access to it and you can get it from Canada, you can get it from China, you can get it from anywhere. So that's that's the gray area that I was talking about. There really isn't a specific classification that it falls into yet. It, it's going to be the FDA. Um, you know, Anything that you know of? I, I, not that I know of, no. Um,
What, what was the website? Say that one more time. Ah, C C D P H. Okay. Thank you. It's a CD, CDPH. So, and you know, to compare and contrast, in Ohio, the Board of Pharmacy, who who has you know control over the medical marijuana program, has said CBD can only be sold in dispensaries, and yet it's legal in the farm bill. So, there's you know, Ohio's even worse from a gray area standpoint, um, and that's some of the some of the challenges run into. You guys are all California here, obviously. Um, I'm not quite as familiar with California as I am Ohio, but I can tell you our customers are in all 50 states, and you know we, they, each one of them has their own problems of figuring this out. And there's really no good guidance. So, does that answer your question? Uh, all right, tinctures, topical. So in you, let me go back to this infused products. So there's another category that I've, I like to call infused products. It's called a whole bunch of different stuff, but I like to call it infused products. And basically, think of this as anything that goes in you or on you. Okay, not drawn in through your mouth, not drawn in through your thumbs, but basically anything you put on top of you or take as a pill or something like that. Topicals being one of the areas. So relatively small segment of the cannabis industry, but, you know, balms, lotions, salves, all of these different things. There's shampoos, there's all kinds of stuff. Basically, if there's something out there that you can put on you, somebody's tried to put some weed in it to figure out if it works or not. Um, solvents are across the board, but generally you're going to find that most people don't want these things to smell like weed. They want them to smell like eucalyptus or lavender or whatever it's going to be, so they tend to use a more of a distillate type of product, a more pure product as an ingredient in the manufacture of these, not something that smells so much like the original cannabis plant material. Edibles, this is probably the, the single biggest growth area, I would argue, or, or at least the growth opportunity area. Edibles covers everything you can go. Go to the grocery store, put weed in it, and then you have an edible. Okay, so that's, that's really where it's at. Every, you know, the more popular ones you're going to find are going to be chocolates. Um, it's hard to see this down here, but there's a whole slew of different types of chocolate available, just like there are in the grocery store. Gummy bears and gummies are, uh, for whatever reason, the, the most popular. I personally hate gummies. My kids try to give me those things. They drive me crazy. Um, I, don't, I just don't like the texture, but I'm, I'm obviously in the minority because there's lots of people who like gummies. Now, states like Ohio, Pennsylvania, more of the East Coast have said gummy bears are not allowed. They look like stuff for kids. They look like candy. Don't make them as a bear. So what they do, they make them look, look like a little gumdrop. Okay? So they don't look like a bear anymore, and that somehow gets over it. But the bottom line is gummies are super, super popular as, as an edible product. Uh, brownies, spaghetti sauce, all those different types of stuff. Um, again, most people don't want their, their edible product to taste like marijuana, so you tend to use a distillate product, right, or a more pure product as the extracted oil or the main ingredient for it. Pills and capsules. So this is another segment that's becoming more popular, especially with the medical area where people say, well, you know, if I take a pill to, you know, cure whatever I'm going to cure, I should be able to take a marijuana pill because it's supposed to be medicine, right? So you're seeing a, a, a sort of a, a, a surge of the, the, the capsules and or the pills coming forward. Most of the capsules tend to be these two-piece capsule mechanisms. So these are literally two pieces of, the, of a capsule. You, you, you get them in a, in a big bag. Somebody painstakingly sits there in a tray and fills each one of those little capsules by hand, generally with a syringe, puts the other half on top of it, puts it together, and it's, a two, it's called a two-piece capsule. Low-volume manufacturing methods is where these go when you're talking you know, hundreds or thousands per day. You don't see too many of the, of the uh, soft gel forms because the equipment is relatively expensive, a couple hundred thousand dollars, and they do hundreds of thousands per hour of these soft gel things. So it, it takes time to start it up, and the, you know, the, the, the handling losses that you have in that type of equipment really don't justify the, the volumes that are currently being utilized. It's getting there. It's going to get there soon. But currently, you still see most of these two-piece capsules available in dispensaries and places like that. Uh, and then, so there's other holes, right? So we talked about our mouth for a while, so we got other holes to deal with as well. <laughs> again, you know, if there's a place to put weed, then somebody's going to try to put weed there. And uh, again, not a super popular product, but uh, it is available, right? Um, you know, there's, there's both for men and women, as you can imagine. So those, uh, those are another type of uh, popular product that you'll see out there. Okay, so moving on from, you know, kind of the oils, the, the infused products, now we're going to talk about what we see in more of the recreational market, what is these, which is these dabbing and vaporizing products. Um, dabbing, vaporizing, so you can see this person is looking, you know, is kind of smoking what looks a lot like a bong. Um, so, you know, for, for those of us who were in college at one point in time but didn't inhale, this is a bong. 
So uh, the difference between a bong and, and a dab rig or a glass rig or, uh, you know, there's a lot of different names for it, is primarily the, the fact that one is designed to smoke a plant material, the other one is designed to smoke a concentrated oil or wax, sometimes referred to as. So what, what they'll do is they'll, they'll create a, a hot surface, whether it's an electronic nail, it's, a, it's literally a, um, um, a heated element, or it's a blowtorch using on a, on a glass thing. One way or another, they'll get the thing hot, they'll drop this, this, this wax element on top of it, and then it'll vaporize, and you draw it into your lungs. Dabbing is incredibly popular in the recreational area, and it's mostly gained popularity, um, and I would argue drove a lot of the butane explosions back 10 years ago, or five years ago even, um, because of the fact that it's a highly concentrated product. Okay, so in cannabis, you're gonna find, again, 10, 20, maybe 25% THC, these concentrated products can get up into the 50s, 60s, 90% concentration levels of THC. So if you're a heavy user of cannabis and you can't get high smoking anymore, you can't get high using a bong, now concentrates open up a whole new world where you can get high again. And that's really what's driving this, this particular segment of the market. Tons of different variations and names and, and consistencies that all basically had just this, this, the same thing. It's trans transfer mechanisms to get THC into your body through a dab rig. Hash oil, right? Food grade, honey oil, goo, lots of different slang names that come through it. You can make these products primarily, uh, you know, with, with any of the different solvents, but butane and propane are probably the most popular to create these types of products. It's very, very sticky. Um, any, if you've ever been in one of these places, you ever touch this stuff, it's incredibly sticky. I, I mean, it, it gets all over everything. It's, it's weird. So what they'll prom what they'll, what they'll see a lot of times is they'll put them into these um, uh, silicone containers. And the silicone basically allows you to get every little you know, drop of material out of the thing so you can put it into your dab rig. Wax is another form. Uh, again, generally extracted with butanes and propanes. Um, it's, it's a lot harder. It's a more crustier or crumbly type of material. Butter, crumble, honeycomb a lot of times can be called this. This one's not exactly honeycomb, but it's close. Again, butane and propane are the primary solvents that are going to create these types of products. Shatter, pull and snap is another one. So shatter is basically, you take that crumbly material, put it into a vacuum oven, let it sit there for half an hour, maybe an hour at a, at a relatively low temperature, and it's eventually going to settle down into a flat sheet. That flat sheet, if you do it right, can be more like taffy where it's kind of bendable, or for the really, really pricey stuff, the guys that do it right with enough, uh, enough of the processing experience will create a snap, basically like glass. And that generally will garner a higher price. Again, these are all very similar in their THC content, but when, when the, the industry commoditizes, they have to try to find ways to differentiate themselves. And in this dabbing market, the way to differentiate yourself is either THC content, which pretty much everybody's got that figured out, or quality of the material, right? And what is quality? Well, it's totally up to the consumer, but a lot of guys will, will tend to say the clearer that it is, right? In other words, the, the, the more transparent it is, the higher quality, and the harder or the more brittle it is, the higher quality. Why? Because it's easier to use in your dab rig. Really, I mean, that's, that's what it comes down to. Fresh frozen is, a, is another example. This is a little bit different, where the other methods were can be uh, extracted primarily from uh, plant material that has been grown, uh, cured, and then ultimately dried and ground up. Fresh frozen is typically done a little bit differently, where you'll take the, the, the cannabis plant, you'll cut it down, you freeze it immediately. And then you put it into uh, butane's propane's uh, extraction systems. What that does is the butane and propane, because of the fact they don't like water, uh, and they run at a relatively cold temperature below freezing, then any of the water molecules that were inside that plant material will stay in the plant material, and generally just the terpenes and the extracted cannabinoids will come through in the butane and propane process. So this live resin or fresh frozen, sometimes it's called, um, are, are very popular products because they're, they're very, very terpene -y. They have a lot of the original terpenes retained, uh, whereas a, a cured plant material that's been dried subsequently will lose a lot of those terpenes. So this gives a, a more, flavorful ex oops, sorry, more flavorful experience for a, a dabbing environment. Any questions? I need a time check. How, how am I doing on time? We get, uh, let's see, it's 11. 11 o'clock, I got another 45 minutes. All right, how's everybody doing? We need a break? Want to stand up? Want to do one of those stand up? And do, uh. Okay, so let's talk about uh, extraction fundamentals here. Oh, I got some, got some issues going on. Sure. Sure. So, 
So it's a, it's the same extra. So I'm going to go. You know what? Let me let me try to answer it as I go through the next slides. I think it'll I think it'll make more sense as we as we get into these these next slides and we talk about kind of the fundamentals of extraction. Um, so. What is this extraction? We've been talking about you know, the market and why bears here. We've been talking about what the different product types are. You go into a dispensary or a rec shop, you're going to see. Basically, extraction is separating the oils, the waxes, where the cannabinoids, the compounds, are suspended within from botanical plant materials. Think of it as, as removing the organic plant material from all the other stuff, the oils, waxes, uh, um, the, what else here? Oils, waxes, plastics, phenolics, uh, compounds, THC, CBD, terpenes, all this different stuff separating those two things apart. That is essentially what extraction is. Sometimes, again, I, I'll use the word concentrate or extract just synonymously. Um, but basically, really, there's, there's two ways to kind of to skin this cat. One way that's, that's popular and a, and a product type that I really didn't even list up there is going to be, uh, you know, with, with mechanical separation methods. Mechan these mechanical methods, dry ice, making keef sometimes. So keef will basically take off the trichomes that are, that are on the plant material. What you do is you literally take a bunch of bud, you put it into a bucket with a piece of dry ice and a, a set of filter bags. There are some mechanical methods to do this now, but the, the cheaper, easier way is a, a, a series of, of different mesh sieve screens in a bucket with a piece of dry ice. Put the flour in there, put the, put the bucket, you sit there, shake it, shake it, shake it. The dry ice makes the, the, the trichomes cold and they break off. Trichomes fall through the different, uh, different mesh in these bags and they can separate it out as keef. Essentially, what you're doing is you're taking your 20% flour to 40% as keef, right? Or, or sometimes, uh, sometimes it's get referred to as uh, bubble bags. Ice water is another way to do it. Instead, instead, instead of using dry ice to make the trichomes cold and break them off and separate them, the trichomes are on the plant material. If you look at, um, if you look at a, a, a cannabis plant, the flour has most of the THC, and then the trichromes are kind of the, the little fuzzy-looking things on the end of it, right? That's where the majority of the THC lies. That's why you can concentrate using these mechanical methods. Ice water is another way to do it, where you literally put it into a washing machine, right? There's lots of stories about kids, you know, making their, their mom's washing machines full of weed, and it, you know, screws all the mechanisms up inside of it. Um, there are more industrial versions of those, but it's literally the same thing. I mean, you take, you take ice water, mix it with it. The ice makes everything cold. Trichromes break off. The problem with ice water ash is you've got to get the water out of it at some point in time. So dry ice is more preferable from the standpoint that dry ice is going to sublimate, turn to gas. You don't have all the liquid to worry about. Uh, either way, they're both mechanical processes, and they've got the same fundamental drawback to it, right, uh, regardless of how you get it off of there. Mecha mechanical methods don't get inside the plant. So you're only going to bust off the trichomes. You're only going to take off what is on the outside available in, the, in that plant material. You can't get inside the plant to extract it out. So solvent methods are the other kind of major category of extraction. Solvents can be CO2. They can be ethanol. They can be butane. They can be propane. They can be uh, what did I list there? Hexane, nap, naphtha. They can even be refrigerant gases like R134A. Right? Refrigerant gases are commonly used in the essential oil industry right? to extract uh, a lot of the, 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 the more valuable essential oils. It's not a very powerful solvent, so it tends to just want to grab the easier stuff like volatiles, like terpenes, but it isn't a really good job of getting deep into the plant, getting the waxes and fats, getting THC, CBD, right? So, you know, refrigerant gas is out there. It, is, it does get utilized. Na na naphtha and hexane will get utilized as well. Pentane is another one that's being used a lot. There's a, a lot of newer extraction methods. But generally, the, the three that are most popular in the cannabis space and or uh, hemp space right now are CO2, butane, propane, and ethanol. Really, really important. So I'm 100% I'm biased, right? I make CO2 extraction equipment. That's where we focus. That's what we like to do. I am 100% biased and think CO2 is the best thing ever. Nobody else should use anything. But that's not reality, right? The reality is really there's pros and cons, right? There's a right time to use each one of these solvents, and it really depends on what you're trying to do at the end. Right? Not necessarily what you're trying to do at the beginning. So every situation has pros and cons. I'm going to walk through some of the, the, these pros and cons that we're going to talk about. Mechanical stuff, we really talked about it already. It's, it's cheap, it's low tech, it's, you can sit there and shake a bucket and you can do it for a couple of bucks and essentially concentrate your, your flour. But the yields are low. It's very labor intensive, right? It's, it's not very scalable. Even if you get a machine that can shake itself, it's really not a, a scalable process because of the fact that you're leaving a lot of material behind. In a commoditizing industry, you don't want to leave a lot of plant material. You don't want to leave a lot of value in your original plant material. You want to try to get all the value out of it you can. So a lot of people will move towards solvents. One solvent category that I didn't list on the, original, on the previous slide 
is these butters, olive oils, and coconut oils. This is the kind of the original extraction method where people would take and, and make brownies and cookies, where they would literally take butter, they put, they get it hot onto a stove, they put a bunch of weed into it, it turned green, it turned nasty because it's pulling all the chlorophyll out of it, but it'd be butter infused with marijuana. THC, all the cannabinoids would be essentially inside that butter, and then you can take the butter and put it into you know brownies, cookies, cakes, whatever whatever you want to cook with, and now you've got a, a marijuana infused edible product. That's some of the earlier days how they used to do it. The biggest problem with it is you can't separate those oils. Using it as a solvent-based extraction method, you can't separate those oils, the, the, the THC, the cannabinoids, from the butter that's inside there. Once they're together, they're really, really, really hard to separate. And so it's not as desirable an extraction method unless you're specifically going to be using it as a butter product. The fact that it grabs chlorophyll like crazy, all, it, it gets dark because it's grabbing the chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is what gives it a grassy taste. That, that makes it undesirable as well. So you don't generally see those as, as kind of widespread extraction methods. Again, the popular ones you're going to find, CO2, butane, propane, and ethanol. So I've got a couple of slides here talking about some of the pros and cons of each one of them. And I'll, I'll get back to your live resin thing here in a second. But generally, the pros of CO2, right? So why, why do people like CO2 extraction, right? It's, it's, it's got what's called selectivity. In other words, by simply changing the pressures and the temperatures that the CO2 equipment operates at, you can draw out weaker or stronger solvents that subsequently get different molecular weights of the plant. So a plant's not just sitting there with a bunch of oil in it all in this you know, one, one area and you grab it out. It's got a whole wide range of molecular weights available to it. Lighter molecular weights are going to be your terpenes, your flavonoids, those kind of things. Medium, medium molecular weights are going to be oils, the lighter oils, the heavier oils. Heavier molecular weights are going to be waxes, fats, lipids, even phenolics for that matter. And so. CO2 has this unique capability to change its solvency or tune its solvency characteristics just by changing the parameters, the temperature and the pressure. Also, because CO2 wants to be a gas at room temperature and pressure, there's no residual solvents. So again, if we're doing you know, cannabis extractions or you're doing even an essential oil extraction, one of the biggest benefits of CO2 is the fact that it's clean. What you're left with at the end of the extraction, hold on just one second, what you're left with at the end of the extraction is essentially the original oil that came from the plant material with no residual solvents left over. That is a fantastic question. I've, I've got two more slides, and I'm, I'm, or maybe a couple more slides. I will get to that question. Um, but the answer is no. It's closed loop, right? CO2 is going to continue to be recirculated. Um, and, but that's part of the extraction stuff. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Very easily automated, right? So the CO2 process is, is an easily automated process. And again, it's got, a, it's got a great perception, right? Nobody's gonna complain about CO2 as their thing. We breathe it in, we breathe it out, right? Trees love it, all that kind of stuff. So it's all good. The pictures that you see here are different fractions. It's kind of tough to see, but this is basically a terpene fraction, very liquidy, you know, flows like water. First bulk fraction is gonna be the, the mostly the CBDs. Uh, the, the CBDs tend to extract out a little bit earlier than the THC. Second bulk fraction is gonna be the heavier molecular weights, lighter molecular weights here in the middle. So just changing temperatures and pressure. You don't do anything to the equipment, right? The equipment stays the same. Just change the temperature and pressure it operates at, you get a different extract. Pretty cool. So why not CO2 for everything? Well, I'd like it to be that way, but unfortunately it does have some cons. High equipment costs, right? It's very expensive because in order to get CO2 as a liquid or a supercritical fluid, it's got to operate at very high pressures, right? Anywhere from 1,000 PSI up to 5,000, even 10,000 PSI. The equipment required to handle those kind of pressures becomes very expensive. And oh, by the way, it's got to be stainless steel because this is a food grade application. So now it's even more expensive. So generally, the, the CO2 equipment is a lot more expensive. The capitalization costs are much more uh, are much higher compared to some of the other pieces of equipment like we're going to talk about. It's still not as fast as some of the other extraction methods that are more popular. CO2 hasn't been utilized widespread for you know many many decades like some of the other extraction methods because it's not very fast. Marijuana has had the low volume, high value proposition that CO2 is needed to be successful. And it's really been kind of the, the, the crux of our business for that matter. Scaling's difficult though, right? It's still a batch operation. You're, you're not gonna find very many, if any, CO2 continuous applications where you got a dump truck on one side and you got a, you know, a spigot coming out the other side. Just not gonna find that with CO2 because of the fact that it has to operate at such high pressures. Right, making a continuous, a continuous feed mechanism is going to operate at 5,000 PSI is a very, very difficult proposition. Some of the pieces of equipment you'll see, this is actually one of our Apex duplex systems, fully automated. There are other pieces of equipment out there from competitors that you'll find that are manually operated, so an operator's got to sit there and, and monitor it and do its thing. And then there's some semi-automatic, kind of a, you know, in between both of them there. 
moving from CO2 into butanes and propanes, right? So why would anybody want to use butanes and propanes? This is the one that, that, that you know, tends to be most sensitive, probably to you guys here, I, I would guess. Uh, you know, why would anybody want to use butane and propane? It's lighter fluid, it's nasty, blah, blah, blah. Well, it has a lower cost to start with, right? It's a very powerful solvent, and it's got a lower cost. So it operates at 100 to 300 PSI, as opposed to 1,000 to 5,000 PSI, right? You have a lot of flexibility, especially as you start mixing the ratios of, of butane and propane together, you can create different products. Not selectivity, but as you re if you remember all the different types of dabbing products that we showed, changing the ratios of butanes and propanes can allow you to create those different textures or those different con uh, consistencies in those types of products. Again, it's powerful, sol powerful solvent, so you tend to get high yields, and the extraction times are relatively low. Not like ethanol kind of low, but a little bit faster than CO2. Again, great for dabbing products. This is where you're primarily going to find the, the, the butanes and propane proposition, the business proposition, is in those dabbing products. Again, a couple examples, shatter and live resin. Okay, so, you know, your, your question was on the live resin, how do you do it? Butane and propane, right, and you extract the, the, the wet, think of it as wet plant material. Right? So you, you cut the plant down, you don't even chop it up. Cut it down, freeze it, then extract it. Right? When, and what that does is basically preserves all the terpenes, all the volatiles, all the flavors, all the aromas, because you, you immediately freeze it, as opposed to waiting for two weeks for the plant to cure, and then maybe even drying it in an oven or something like that. All of those things will boil off the volatile oils. Volatile oils will, will essentially evaporate at about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So in, that's why you can smell it. And so as, as you smell it, they're evaporating off and they're long, no longer available in the plant. Fresh frozen is essentially a way to try to capture that initial essence of the plant. So what's the con? I have the biggest con everybody knows about is explosive, right? This is the stuff that's in lighter fluid, right? So butanes, propanes are very, very explosive, right? And they, call, they, they require class one, division one facilities and all that kind of stuff. They can be operated safely, right? There's, there's a bit of a misnomer and maybe even a desire to not have them operate at all because they're so dangerous. Well, the reality is butane and propane have been used widely across other industries for a long time and it's been done safely. However, the lack of regulations, the, the gray areas, all those kind of things have driven, uh, you know, some of the challenges that come with butane explosions, particularly in open loop applications. We'll talk about what the difference is here in a minute. Residual solvent limits. Not every state has these, but most states have some kind of residual solvent limit where you've got you know, essentially, you know, parts per million or sometimes even parts per billion uh, residual, residual testing requirements that people have to pass. Uh, and so because of the fact that CO2 wants to be a gas, butane and propane don't necessarily have that luxury. They have to be either drawn into a vacuum or they have to be exposed to temperature in order to get all of the residual solvents out of there. Bad perception of regulatory groups. Anybody got a bad perception of uh, butane extractions in here? No. One, two, really? All right, I thought you guys would like all jump all over me on that one. Uh, bad perception, generally with regulatory groups. Right? There's a fear, right, and you know, a, a, a well-founded fear that people are going to blow themselves up using this stuff as a solvent. Why would anybody want to do this? Again, it can be done safely, and we'll talk about what some of those safe mechanisms are here in a minute, but it can be done safely. Finally, scaling, still CO2, butane have the same problem. It's a batch process. It has to operate under pressure, so it's difficult to be able to have a continuous feed mechanism in a system that's operating under pressure. So you still have the batch process. This is a self-contained class one, division one room. These are becoming more popular. Basically, you drop this in, whether it's inside a facility or outside in the middle of a field like that, it doesn't really matter. These self-contained rooms are becoming more popular as, a, as an operating area, basically the facility for doing a, 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 a butane and propane extraction. This is a typical piece of equipment that you see inside of one of those rooms. Generally, you're gonna have the columns where the material gets loaded, some kind of a reservoir to hold the, the uh, butane propane solvent, and then some kind of a capture basin where you're gonna have the, the butane and propane that have extracted the oil go into, it gets some heat applied to it, and the butane and propane off gas get captured and put back into, uh, recirculated back into the, the catch basin. Moving on to the, the third more popular one, ethanol, low cost, right? That's the biggest thing. Ethanol has been used for decades, primarily in the food products and uh, food, food industry, food ingredient industry. Uh, it's, it's very high yield, very fast extraction times, especially when it's warm. It's really powerful when it's warm. Um, it's, it's well accepted, it's gross, it's, you know, had, it's very easy to, to use, and because it operates at room temperature, room pressure, it can be easy to scale, right? You can find an actual, you know, continuous processing plant uh, put together relatively easily. Some of the differences we're talking about, warm ethanol, uh, because it's very powerful, you see this is green. That green is coming from the chlorophyll in the plant. Anytime you extract anything green, not just cannabis, it tends to want to draw the chlorophyll out and makes a green extract. Undesirable because it's dark. Remember, clear is more higher quality, more better quality. Sorry for the bad English. Um, green is, is generally going to drive a lower quality. Gold is gold, 
right? And that's, that's kind of the perception of the industry. So most people tend to want to do a cold ethanol extraction, which means they have to put some additional resources into the extraction process with ethanol to make it colder so they don't draw out as many of the fats, waxes, chlorophyll, things like that. Uh, so the distillation portion, uh, which I've, I've got a couple of examples here, is going to be very similar uh, to, to making booze, yeah, because effectively when you're done with an ethanol extraction, so it meant, the, the extraction process is you, you literally put your material inside of a, you could do a 55-gallon drum if you wanted to, put, it, put your, your plant material in it, have some kind of a screen or a bag or a mesh or something along those lines, fill it full of ethanol, let it sit there. Some people will, will centrifuge it, some people will shake it up, let it sit there for a couple of minutes then draw off that ethanol and oil or extracted oil mixture. Then you gotta separate the two, and that's where you're gonna find the distillation process, similar to, to booze making. When you say warm ethanol extraction, So warm is gonna be anywhere from uh, you know, room temperature up to 120 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Somebody else, I thought I saw another question. So cons, right, if ethanol is so great at everything, why aren't we using it all the time? Well, it still has a flammability factor. It's not explosive, but it does have flammability. So you tend to see class one, division two facilities being built and focused on for ethanol extractions. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, some municipalities are a little bit more restrictive. They'll say class one, div one. Some of the manufacturers of ethanol extraction equipment just say, just do class one, div one, because that way you're, you're guaranteed to not have any problems with you guys, the, the regulators and inspectors out there. Chlorophyll drives cold processing, so you're driving an additional expense, additional thing. A lot of times people are running these things at minus 40 or even minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And, and that's, again, to, to try to avoid the secondary processing requirements to get the chlorophyll out after the initial extraction. Well, when you run at minus 40, minus 80, that creates some hazards associated with the cold temperatures, right? So you need to have insulation on the things, you need to have, you know, cold uh, hand protection, finger protection, things like that. There are still residual, sol residual solvent limits uh, from, you know, different municipalities, different states have residual solvent requirements. Uh, and ethanol can be taxed, right? So you can get, you can get ethanol that's not taxed, you can get ethanol that is taxed. Sometimes it's challenging to get, sometimes you get into licensing situations. But it does have this additional burden of you got to be able to get it to begin with. And then, like I said before, significant post-processing energy is going to be required to recover that ethanol, the distillation process that you were asking about before. Essentially, you've got to be able to get that ethanol out, away from extracted, remove it from the extracted oils whole bunch of different types of pieces of equipment you're going to find glass, uh, glassware, basically a glass reactor, tend to be pretty expensive and they break easily so you don't see these as much in the, in the larger processing operation. Refrigerator, this is literally an extractor inside of a freezer. Centrifugal mechanisms, so one of the biggest challenges uh, of this method is you leave a lot of uh, ethanol inside the plant material. So to get some of that ethanol out, a lot of people are spinning it. Right? You, you'll find industrial salad spinners being utilized in this, washing machines, or specific made, you know, specific custom-made centrifugal extraction platforms like that one. And then you'll start to see tanks which, uh, which will hold it. A very, very similar process between the ethanol and the butane and propane, just ethanol runs at room temp run, run, sorry, runs at room pressure, right? Standard atmospheric pressure, whereas uh, butane and propane need to be under pressure, 100 to 300 psi. So not as important for you guys here, but I think it, it, you know, it's, it's worth, worth you guys seeing at least some of the, the stuff. From a, from a costing standpoint, right, pros and cons, CO2 is definitely the highest, whereas you're gonna find ethanol is, is high, low from the solvent cost, high from, uh, <laughs> high from the cost, I don't do it. low from the cost of equipment standpoint, high from the cost of uh, the actual material, right? So ethanol is low, CO2 is high, butane, propane fall in the, meat, in the middle. Whereas the facility to operate in, class one, division one, those types of NFPA requirements, butane, propane wins, right? It's the most expensive. These two end up offsetting each other right here, right? Because of the fact that the equipment's more expensive, but the facility is less expensive, CO2, that kind of stuff. Maintenance, those kind of things are there. Basically, you know, when people are making the decision, when our customers are making the decision, which solvent mechanism am I going to use? This is some of the decision matrix that, that they're going to utilize. This is the decision matrix that they're going to utilize to make the, uh, make the choice. I said that terrible, sorry. But what's more important than that decision matrix is what they want to make at the end, right? Why would they want to choose one or the other? Well, some of these things are better at making these other types of products than others. Vape pens, for instance, really good, uh, you know, good across the board. Not so good with ethanol, really. That's, that's probably be a medium or an okay. But the reality is, you know, CO2, butane, and propane, they make some decent vape pens, right? Dabbing products, great for butanes and propanes. Edibles infused products, uh, you know, are good for CO2. 
for the oils uh, because you generally want it to have the terpenes and, and that kind of smell. But it's okay for infused products because, you know, it's just not as fast. This one right here, ethanol infused products, this good right here is why you're seeing this huge surge in the CBD industry right now. Right? The ethanol industry is, is going there. But you know, one of the biggest problems, if, we didn't, if I didn't cover it there with ethanol, is it's really a one-trick pony. It does one thing really good, and that's making a whole bunch of bulk distillate. What it doesn't do is allow a customer to differentiate itself and, and create uh, different types of terpene profiles for vape pens and things like that. But because there's a huge demand for CBD in particular, and because it has a, you know, a, a better perception or a more legal perception, there's, there's just a tremendous uh, focus on it right now. And that's where you're seeing the majority of operations kind of really springing up on that. Okay, so really, really quick. I want to, this is, this is like two or three slides here. I want to try to emphasize manufacturing methods that you're going to see in these different facilities are going to be across the, all across the board, huge variations of it. But generally they're going to have, and that's why the slide's kind of messy. It's, it's, it's intended to show just chaos because if you go into one facility, you're going to see some stuff. You go into another facility, you're going to see maybe completely different stuff, but they're all fundamentally doing the same thing. They're extracting first CO2, butane, propane, ethanol, hexane, doesn't matter which one. They're extracting the oils from the plant material. It's going to get some kind of goopy, nastiness that looks like this stuff down here. Then they've got to go do some kind of secondary processing to either get the solvent out of it or separate chlorophyll, waxes, fats, resins, phenolics, even THC sometimes as a post-processing step and a refinement step. These post-processing steps can be two, three, four, five different individual steps. I don't know of any specific piece of equipment out there that, that will do everything soup to nuts, all the way from the front end to the back end. You're starting to see some larger processing plants in the ethanol and CBD world that are, that are, that are popping up, but those are millions of dollars and they're gonna be few and far between. These systems are, are much more common. These smaller skid-based systems are, are much more common. And to, regardless of what you go in there and what you see, you're almost always going to find these individual steps. Extraction, post-processing, could be two, three, four different steps of post-processing and refinement. And then ultimately, you're going to see goes into a final package. Okay, so for CO2, you, you know, what, is, what are these steps you're going to see? Raw oil extraction. This is just getting, again, some of these different goopy, I just want to show you the kind of consistencies of the, the extracted oil that comes out with CO2 and, 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 uh, and subcritical or supercritical, the different versions of it. Post-processing. The types of post-processing you're going to see are going to be based on the types of product that the customer is manufacturing. So vape pens, right? You're going to have to remove these plant fats, plant fats, waxes, lipids. They have to be separated or else they tend to clog up the vape pens. So you'll see a process generally utilized called winterization, which is the, the next slide. Um, dilution, a lot of times is a problem too. If it's too thick, it won't flow into the wicking mechanism of a vape pen. So they have to dilute it down. Sometimes they dilute it with MCTs or, you know, coconut oil, things like that. Sometimes they'll do it with, uh, with, um, with terpenes, right? And literally just make it more viscous with the, uh, with the terpenes. Dabbing products, shutter, honeycomb, crumble, all these different types of stuff that we talked about. Usually you're going to see a vacuum oven. A lot of times in, these, in the big operations, they'll have walls of vacuum ovens, you know, 10, 12, 15, 20 vacuum ovens sitting there basically just pulling out all the residual butanes and propanes to create honeycomb, shatter, shatter, crumble, things like that. Edibles infused products. This is where the kitchens start to come in, right? It's anybody who's making chocolates, anybody who's making cookies, you know, all these different types of stuff. This is where the commercial kitchen starts to come in. And, you know, there really isn't a lot of inspection. Some of these places are nasty. I, you know, I can't believe how dirty they are. And, there, you know, there's no quality control. There's no inspections. There's nothing going on. It's really disgusting. So I, I, you know, if you guys get an opportunity to go in there and tell them to clean it up, please do, because that makes our equipment run better when it's clean. Yeah, gen yeah, generally the, the facilities you'll see, it, it, they're not, they're not uh, co-located with like a, like a co-packer or a commercial kitchen kind of operation. They're generally... Uh, what we find in our town is there's a couple of kitchens with crystal plants. Mm. And uh, the question is, you know, is there a So I, I, I would, I, I guess the short answer is I don't know. Uh, you know, if there's, if there's kitchens that are being rented, and maybe somebody out here has some experience of uh, a cannabis processing operation utilizing a temporary kitchen, essentially. 
um, you know, it presents all kinds of challenges from the standpoint of, of you know, cross-contamination, getting THC into future products. Um, you know, I can't imagine a licensed entity wanting to go doing that, but certainly I could see, uh, you know, one of the, the black market operators trying to do something like that for sure. Uh, generally, you know, the, it, making it in a kitchen is not hard. Right? Usually these products aren't, aren't terribly difficult. The volumes are relatively low, and the prices are high. You know, I mean, a 10 milligram chocolate is going to cost you 20 bucks. You know, 15 bucks in a, in a rec shop, that kind of stuff. So, I mean, it's, it's relatively expensive still. And the volumes are low, so you, you tend to see manual packaging. Uh, I, was at a, I was at a shop in Puerto Rico last week. I had a, had a you know, lovely old lady sitting there just wrapping up tin foil to round chocolates all day. That's all she did. Right? Took the chocolate, put it in there, wrapped it up all day. <laughs> so I was like, good. I'm glad there's people out there that can do that because I couldn't do it. But that's, that tends to be what we see. Again, very, very, generally very dirty operations. I, very few of them are clean. Very, very few of them are inspected from a food safety, food cleanliness standpoint. Um, and just because it, it's still kind of a gray area that the FDA doesn't jump in. Sometimes the, the municipality will have a, a food inspection group that will come in. Um, but it's not always available, right? It, it just, you know, some, some of the smaller communities just don't have those kind of, those kind of resources. Um, with your equipment and GMO model, are they inspected at all? So we haven't, we'll get asked for GMP primarily. Um, and, and, you know, will it, will it qualify in a GMP application is, is generally, we can't uh, certify it, NSF, we can't certify it uh, GMP, but the operation can utilize it and, and certify their operation as GMP. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. That's a great question. I have a slide coming up here on that one. Uh, the question was this certified UL, ETL, that kind of stuff. I'll, I'll get to that here in just a sec. Uh, winterization. I talked about it before. So we're talking about, you know, post-processing, secondary processing requirements. Uh, you know, again, all these different types of stuff uh, are going to be utilized for secondary processing. Winterization is a very, very popular one. It's utilized in most of the, the extraction methods. Um, you're going to see things like rotor evaporators, which is this little guy down here on the bottom, freezers, ethanol, right? So a lot of times this is, an, this is a key point. You'll start to see ethanol utilized in addition to CO2. Many of our customers, not all of them, but many of our customers will utilize multiple extraction methods uh, as well as utilize ethanol for this, the secondary processing. So now we're starting to see not just an individual, you know, everybody's doing CO2 or everybody's doing ethanol. You're actually seeing multiple customers trying to create the different product lines. Remember, ethanol is better at some stuff than CO2. Butane and propane are better at other things. The big guys have all three. And you're going to see all three of these extraction processes utilized in, in different facilities. But winterization is a, a very common secondary processing step, specifically to remove fats and waxes and lipids from extracted oils, primarily for vape pens. The biggest problem with winterization is, I'm sorry, the biggest problem is it causes loss of flavor. You have to distill it. You have to get that ethanol out. So you expose it to a lot of heat. Why do people do it? Again, benzo oil. Finally, we talked about it before, this distillate process. This is really getting to the, the, the highest level of purity. It's 95, 90, 99 percent kind of purity. The clear fractional distillation, molecular separation, there's lots of different versions of this. Almost all of them involve glassware. Some of the really expensive ones are going to be stainless steel versions of them, but it's almost all glassware. So if you, if you walk in and see you know, a setup like this, it's got a lot of glassware in it, it's generally going to be some kind of a distillation apparatus. There are smaller benchtop uh, glassware apparatus, apparati like those as well. Um, short path distillation is the, is the typical name for those. Um, that's that. Okay, so I want to do a, a, a fairly quick deep dive on CO2 extraction, right? Basically, the general components you're going to find in any extraction system are the extraction vessels where you put the plant material, CO2 cylinders, right? So you're going to have, you know, CO2 cylinder store, high pressure storage cylinder kind of stuff. This is a compressor, chiller, and a heater combination, and then the separation vessels here. All stainless steel, fully automated. How does CO2 work? We talked about it before. It's, it basically has the ability to be tuned. Just like every other thing out there, it's got three phases, solid, liquid, gas. So CO2 is generally measured by pounds, right, as opposed to pressure and that kind of stuff. Uh, it depends on the size. Our smallest five liter system is going to contain about seven, maybe 10 pounds of CO2 in it as it's circulating. Uh, the larger systems are going to be up into 30, 40, 50 pounds uh, of CO2. Yeah, oh yeah, it's, it's, these systems are well below that. Uh, 
So why, why CO2? Again, solid liquid gas, but it has this other thing called supercritical fluid. Basically, some gases have the ability to go what's called supercritical. It's kind of a combination of both liquid and gas, and it gives it properties of both. So it can get inside the nooks and crannies like a gas, but it transports, it can carry the same way a liquid can. That's why CO2 becomes important. Really quickly, how does it work? Going through kind of the process of the extraction, right? So over here is the extraction vessel. This is where your plant material is going to get loaded. Separation vessel, this is where we're going to separate the CO2, the liquid CO2 or the supercritical CO2 from the extracted oils. And then some kind of a storage cylinder. In our systems, it's generally going to be a, a, a high-pressure storage flask. The initial process is we fill. So we load our plant material over here and we take CO2 out of the bottle, dump it right in. Equalize across the bottle into the extraction vessel. Next step we're going to do is we're going to turn on the pump, right? Take the CO2 out of here, push more CO2 into the extraction vessel. Get it to the point where it's high enough pressure to be a liquid or supercritical fluid. Now it's acting like a solvent. It's dissolving the plant oils, the oils out of the plant material. And it's going to carry those oils through this valve over here into the separator where we decompress the CO2. Take that CO2, it's decompressed, it turns into a gas. It loses its ability to be a solvent. Gaseous CO2 can then be compressed push back, goes into what's called a closed loop. Somebody over here asked about the closed loop stuff. This is closed loop. We take the CO2 and we continually circulate it. Once we're done, we recover the CO2. We take the CO2 out of the extraction vessel, goes to the separator to drop any oils it has in it, and goes to the pump. But instead of going back into the extraction vessel, we push it back over into the storage tank. So we recover the CO2 at the end of it. Only at the very, very end of the process do we have any losses. We pump it down to about 100 PSI. At the end of the 100 PSI, we vent that remaining CO2 out. So that CO2, that vent line has to be connected to an outdoor, right, blow the CO2 outside, that kind of stuff. Important point, butane, propane work exactly the same way, right? Except for generally, you'll see it instead of a continuous process where it's recirculating, kind of like an air conditioner, generally butanes and propanes, they'll do exactly the same thing, where they'll take, they'll take liquid butane or liquid propane, fill this thing up, but then they'll do it as a batch, they'll dump it. They'll take this valve and put it on the bottom. They'll dump all of the liquid butane and propane and the oil over into a separation mechanism, all in one shot, isolate it, and then heat it to essentially evaporate off or distill off the, the uh, butane and propane over into some kind of a collection container. Sometimes they'll pump it directly out. Sometimes they'll draw a vacuum. There's different ways to go about it. But this general extraction process is exactly the same for butane and propanes. The individual steps between them are going to be slightly different. Ethanol, almost exactly the same thing. So imagine that this is going to be an ethanol extraction vessel. We dump our ethanol into it, let it sit there. We bring it over here into the separation vessels where we heat it up. Generally, the dif difference between butane and propane CO2 and ethanol is this mechanism is called an evaporator. It's generally a whole separate piece of equipment for the distillation process. The simplest version of it is a rotary evaporator. The more complicated that you're going to see here in the most, you know, last two, three, four months is called a falling film evaporator. I got some pictures of those here in a minute. Again, CO2 extraction, you're going to go this kind of oil. Safety. CO2 is non flammable. Okay, so you know, the differences between these things. CO2 is non flammable. There's really no explosion risk. So it doesn't have a huge amount of facility requirements. It is an asphyxiant, right? So it does require CO2 monitoring. You have to make sure you have enough oxygen in the room or uh, 5,000 ppm tends to be the, the set points for the CO2 monitoring. Placarding, it has an oxygen deficient atmosphere potential, right? So it has to be placarded. Venting of the relief points and the vent points to the outside, one of the other requirements. And then obviously you've got, you know, compressed gas cylinders, so you have to have safe, safe handling, safe storage. What this doesn't say and what it doesn't require is excessive ventilation requirements. So you don't have to have basically a triggered ventilation, you don't have to have class one div one, you don't have to have any of those kind of things for a CO2 environment, right? According to all of the codes and standards that are currently out there today. Occasionally, you'll find some overzealous municipalities that'll say, oh, it, had, you know, it, it could suffocate, so therefore you have to have all these ridiculous you know, closed loop stuff going on and ventilation requirements and fire suppression and all this kind of stuff. And you know, it's, it's, a, it's a bit challenging, obviously, but you know, it is what it is. You've got to comply with the regulations. Uh, generally, we don't see people putting separate rooms inside of a room. So there'll be a facility. If, it's, if the room requires sprinkling because it's a room inside of a facility, then it's going to require sprinkling. But a lot of times they don't require additional sprinkling on top of it. Every once in a while you'll see somebody get overzealous and do it, but most of the time not.
So I would argue that that wasn't an explosion, right? That was a, an uncontained release of pressure, right? But it's, it's important. It's, it, it, I mean, it really is. It's, it's a subtle differentiation, but one requires fire, fire, flame, explosion. The other requires a release of pressure. And it's absolutely got pressure, you know, containment requirements. So, you know, I, I don't like the word explosion in CO2 because it's not really an explosion. Absolutely, people can screw up and open a vessel that's under pressure, uh, design vessels and systems, not having to go listed, things like that. There you go. There, there's the there's the more uh, scientific side of it. Um, my next slide does operate at high pressures. So how do we? How can you, as regulators, inspectors, those guys, make sure that their their things are there? There's really kind of four steps that you can do to make sure that somebody doesn't blow the top off of their uh, storage container. There, proper design starts there. Right. So you have to have the thing properly designed. Generally, ASME requires four times safety factor. So if it operates at 2,000 psi, it's got to withstand 8,000 before it's going to have any kind of a, any kind of a failure mechanism, and that's, that's tested and, and those kind of things. Electrical control system is going to be the secondary side, so monitor and then employ an electrical control system to, to have the, the safety pieces in it. Mechanical pressure relief valves is going to be the third one, so those are generally referred to as non-isolable relief valves, so that if the pressure does get out of control for some reason or another, the control system, the electrical control system can't handle it, the relief valves will, will do it. The non-isolable piece is important, it means that the, the relief valve has to be attached to the pressure containing vessel with no valves or no boundaries or no isolations between them. And then finally, operator training is the fourth step for our systems. Right? We don't rely on the operators generally to, to make sure they do anything, but you have to train them properly so they don't open a vessel up while it's under pressure. You guys generally aren't going to get involved with ASME, but just for a, from, a, from a standpoint, thank you, from the standpoint of a, from understanding it, ASME allows six inches in diameter. So anything six inches and under in diameter, uh, and there are some other requirements, but generally if it's six inches or under in diameter, it doesn't have to be what's called code stamped. Uh, so we are an ASME pressure vessel manufacturing facility. We've got our ASME certified stamps, but it's expensive. And so a lot of times, until a municipality or a state requires ASME stamped vessels, generally you're probably not going to see them because people don't want to pay the extra cost for it. And this exclusion right here that ASME has built into their, their uh, codes and standards, say it doesn't have to be stamped. It's under six inches. So a lot of times you'll see longer and skinnier extraction vessels as opposed to shorter and fatter because they're trying to basically get under this exclusion right here. Several states have, uh, have, have said things like underwriter's laboratory, it has to be in, in compliance with certain standards such as ANSI, underwriter laboratory, ASDM, but that's all they give. They don't say this specific section of the code, this specific area, right? It's still, you know, pretty unregulated when it comes to these kind of things and it requires the operators and the manufacturers to be compliant. One point on here, the engineering peer review covers pressure readings in detail. So what is this, this engineering peer review? I'm going to fast forward here to one second, mechanical relief valves. What is this engineering peer review thing? So this is one of the things that, uh, that if you guys haven't heard about it, you should be looking for it. Engineering peer review basically started in Colorado and says there's, because there, there isn't a lot of guidance on the, the codes and the specifications, what can somebody like you do to make sure that these things are going to be safe? Engineering peer review does a nice job of, of, of covering that. So engineering peer review says, hey, I'm going to look at all these different codes that are up here, and I'm going to say, okay, this thing, this thing actually fits. It's, it's pressure rated to the proper point. It has all the, the uh, you know, international fire code and, and NFPA and all these different elements. They've been considered, they've been evaluated by a professional engineer in that specific state. Not every state requires us. I think there's 11 currently out of the 30 some odd states that have, have legalized, but almost every municipality we're finding look for the peer review. Certainly as an equipment manufacturer, we advertise that our systems are all peer reviewed and can be safely operated. One key point, lack of electrical. So you would ask the question about UL standards, right? Currently, there is no UL standard, right? So Colorado said if it's not ETL or UL listed, it has to be peer reviewed. That's where the peer review came from. It would certainly be nice to have a UL listing so that we could all just kind of rubber stamp it and move on. Unfortunately, UL 1389 doesn't exist yet. So UL has standards for air conditioners and things like that, but it doesn't have anything in place for uh, extraction equipment specifically. UL 1389 is being developed to, to bridge that gap, but I'll bet it's a year and a half or two years before we see it out there. So in the meantime, what can you guys be looking for? You can look for things like peer review, which covers all of those different standards. But it doesn't really cover the electrical safety part. The electrical safety can be bridged by a generalized UL508A, which is industrial control cabinets, industrial control panels. 
as I said before, EPR, Engineering Peer Review, UL 508A, is, the most, is currently the most comprehensive uh, inspections or requirements that you guys as regulators, inspectors, uh, general people can go in there and look at to get to be the most comprehensive. Make sense? Any, uh, any questions? I got a couple more minutes here. It, is this liquid in the extraction vessels? Yes. It starts out as liquid and then it's compressed or filled further. Um, it's different, our systems pump gas, actually, so it'll take gaseous CO2 and then convert it to liquid. Other systems will pump liquid CO2 as a, as a liquid, subcooled. And then, so it starts out as liquid and then goes to gas and go backwards? Yeah, exactly. Okay. As, it goes through the, as it goes through the closed loop process, it goes liquid gas, liquid gas, liquid gas. Yeah. It's exactly like an air conditioner, yeah. Yep. In, in Europe, it's very popular as a, as a refrigeration system. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, back up to your slide where you compared uh, CO2 and, and ethanol and the cost, you mentioned the ethanol, the, the using of the ethanol is going to go up a lot because it's higher. So what amount of ethanol would you use in ethanol extraction for like a small to medium size system? So um, small, smaller systems are going to be less than 50 gallons. Uh, you know, larger facilities can get up into a couple hundred gallons easily. So when I'm leaving facilities, they're telling me that they're going to use five gallons of ethanol? Uh, if they're doing an ethanol extraction yeah. um, and not, not winterization, I would say they're probably full of crap. Yeah, it's, it'd be really, really hard to only have five gallons of CO2 and have any volume. I mean, if it's a really, really small operation, maybe. I think you five gallon five gallon at a time, sure, but realize that they're going to have multiple steps that are using five gallons at a time. So I mean, the total ethanol in the facility is going to be way more than five gallons for sure. Uh, that's that's a tiny amount of ethanol. Yeah. Uh, um, I, five gallons for winterization, yeah, no problem. But if they're actually extracting using ethanol, especially cold ethanol, then they're also going to have to have a falling film evaporator that's got its own five gallons. They're going to have to have storage for s storage cylinders. Uh, I'd, I would be really surprised if, if they got actual five gallons and that's all they're using. Sure. Any other uh, questions? So thanks, everybody. Uh, remember the uh, number 2636 for those of you who haven't uh, gotten your credits yet. Uh, feel free to get your credits. Got one more question in the back there. Oh. Yeah, and, and we're a video in this as well, so if you guys are interested in seeing it later. Uh, sorry, there was one number there. What, 3259 is the checkout. Right. So. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. If you got any questions, uh, let me know.